sitting on a meditation for a little while about where the church gets its forgiveness of sins with respect to the new covenant conversation, which um, just because I'm doing a new covenant message versus everlasting covenant doesn't mean I'm engaging in a debate with anybody, really. I'm not, this is for my subs who are tracking with me. There's other people who strongly disagree with this position and they've got all kinds of objections and I don't feel I'm obligated to answer all those and keep the dialogue going out there because it's not a dialogue. You know, if you got questions, come to me with them. Um, but, you know, if you've got a channel and I'm blocked on it and you're saying things and doing videos about it, uh, or if I go and answer any of your questions and would be attacked by a mob, then obviously we're not going to be able to have a dialogue, nor, nor do we need to. You're free to object and show your objections and teach the way you want to teach. Um, as long as you're not using new covenant to bring people back into relationship to the law and bring them under Moses or backload works into the gospel, all of which are possible <laughs> uh, if you hold the new covenant for the church. Um, but anyway, in Hebrews, there are three references to a decree that God made to Christ or a covenant that God made with Christ actually four um, obviously 1320 Hebrews 1320 which I believe the the God of the peace uh, brought again from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant I don't believe that is synonymous with the New Covenant. I believe that that is what Hebrews makes its appeal to. Uh, in chapter 1 of Hebrews, it makes an appeal to God's decree to Christ in Psalm 2. That this day I have begotten thee, and uh, I have set thee on my holy hill in Zion, ask of me... Um, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Uh, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and you will rule them with a rod of iron. That is an inspiration in the psalm that declares to the seed of David that he will inherit the nations. And that resurrection is the day he was begotten as God's son. Um, and then Hebrews again later, when establishing the Melchizedek priesthood, makes uh, an appeal to Psalm 110, which again talks about, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So it's talking, the father speaking to the son. And then he says, uh, I've sworn that you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And it is based on that decree to the seed of David mentioned in the psalm that the, the writer of Hebrews tells us that we know that there has to be a change in the Aaronic priesthood. That it's going to wax old, that it's going to be taken out of the way because there's a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Now that priesthood is not given according to the terms of any terms of the new covenant for Israel, the high priesthood of Christ, according to the order of Melchizedek, is because he is the son of God in resurrection. And it is in the not according to a carnal commandment, but according to the power of his incorruptible life. And it is based on a decree that the father made to the son. When did he make that? Well, I believe it's eternity past. I believe that this is what God had in, in his mind before he created anything. That's why Christ is the lamb slain for the foundation of the world. But he confirmed the covenant with Christ that secures our inheritance and our eternal salvation that his sonship and his priesthood are, is for. His high priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek and his sonship are both for our salvation. His sonship... Uh, is that God sent the Son of God to become the Son of Man. He incarnated, he became a man in the flesh, 
He partook of flesh and blood like us, because the children who were to be heirs of glory were partakers of flesh and blood. He partook of the same, and to taste death for all of us, that, that he could lead us into glory. He became a man, okay, and then in resurrection, his humanity, what the seed of David, was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of Holiness by the resurrection from the dead, according to um, Romans 1, 4. And that is the gospel. Paul says, the gospel of God concerning his son who was born seed of the David, seed of David according to the flesh, but declared to be the son of God with power by the spirit of holiness according to the resurrection from the dead. And the reason he went through that process was not for himself, because he was already the son of God, but because the children are partake, who he's bringing into glory are partakers of flesh and blood, he partook of the same. And in his death and resurrection, he became the firstborn among many brethren who would be conformed to his image and glorified. And so he is the author of our salvation. He's the captain of our salvation. That's why the seed of David became the son of God. It's related to our salvation. And the reason he is the high priest is, according to the order of Melchizedek, is so that he can save us to the uttermost. He ever lives to intercede for us, and he is going to bring us into glory through his intercession. So he has these two roles declared in Hebrews. One as the heir of all things, and that was declared by the Father to the Son, the, not the Son of God, he's already the heir of all things to the Son of God, as the Son of God, but as the Son of Man. He inherits on behalf of humanity as the uh, firstborn from the dead. And then his high priesthood is also in order to save us to the uttermost. So these two things are based on decrees that God made with the Son of God, the seed of David, uh, that make him our salvation. And that's what Hebrews appeals to for our salvation, which he, which is Hebrews 1 and through 3 talks about our great salvation that makes us partakers of the heavenly calling and subjects the world to come to us. That That's his point in Hebrews is that, you know, how, how should we uh, escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And he says it wasn't to angels that he subjected the world to come. But, and then he talks about the Son of God. Uh, and what is man that you, know, you are mindful of him? What, what The angel says that. What is man that you are mindful of him? You made him a little lower than angels, but you've set him over the works of your hands. And he says, well, we don't see all that subjected yet, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he might partake of death or taste of death for every man. And then he talks about, you know, he didn't come to help angels. He came to help us and bring us into glory. So on the one hand, our salvation that Hebrews is talking about is our co-inheritance with Christ. The subjecting of the world to come is for the seed of Abraham. That is not promised in the new covenant. The new covenant promises Israel their place in their land. It is the forgiveness of sins for national Israel. Uh, it is the removal of their sins, and then he puts his spirit in them and causes them to walk in his way in absolute holiness. They won't transgress. They won't depart from his ways. They will be holy through and through. Um, and that will be so they can stay in their land and enjoy the blessing. That is theirs by inheritance, not because of the new covenant, but because of Abraham. The covenant God made with Abraham and his seed. So anyway... Hebrews again is appealing. I'm trying to make a I'm trying to build to something here, so bear with me. Hebrews is appealing to this already established thing between God and the Son. First, for the great salvation that subjects the world to come to us and makes us co heirs with Christ, heirs of glory, makes him the captain of our salvation, as the Son of God, who has the rod of iron. And it's talking about his kingdom. And it's talking about sharing his inheritance as partakers of the heavenly calling. Again, not the earthly calling, the heavenly calling. 
Then the next portion is talking about Melchizedek, which was also established by decree between the Father and the Son. And it is on the basis of Melchizedek that the writer of Hebrews tells us we know from the scriptures that there's going to be a new priesthood, or at least that the old one is passing away, because he made, he already swore by decree that Christ, the seed of David, is going to be a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And we know that no one from Aaron ever uh, could participate in the line of Judah, and yet the seed of David is from Judah. So a priest, there has to be a change of law. Well, it's, it is a change of law, but it's not according to a carnal earthly ordinance. Uh, it's according to God's decree, which made Christ the Son of God, set him at his right hand, you know, subjected everything to him, and also made him the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek in the power of an indestructible life, again for our salvation, that he might save us to the uttermost. Then in chapter 6, Hebrews tells us that this decree, again, was uh, God made a covenant, a vow. And he didn't need to make a vow with himself, but for our sake he did it. Okay, He didn't need to establish a covenant between himself because he's, God is one. It says this in Galatians 3 too. A mediator... A, a mediator is of two parties, but God is one. And yet, God made a covenant with himself. So Hebrews 6 talks about how he could swear by no greater, so he swore by himself. Uh, Hebrews, let me just read it real quick. Hebrews 6. Uh, okay. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation to them is an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing to more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, uh, which enters into the that within the veil, where our forerunner for us has entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So he's saying, look, God didn't need to make a covenant with himself, but he did it for us in Abraham's time. And that's referring back to Genesis 15 when God put Abraham to sleep and the torch and the furnace passed through the pieces of the sacrifice and God swore. That was God covenanting with the seed of Abraham. According to Galatians 3, let's look at that real quick. Uh... Verse 16, I guess. Here he says, But brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be a man's covenant. Yet if it's confirmed, no man disannuls or adds thereto. He says the exact same thing in Hebrews 6. So he's talking about the same thing. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says not to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Christ is the seed to whom the promise was made. And this I say that the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after cannot disannul. In other words, this was 430 years before the Mosaic law, God confirmed a covenant with Abraham's seed, who is the heir of the promise, and that is Christ. And Hebrews is talking about the same thing. Hebrews 6. Um... Again, for, for, for when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. So after he patiently endured, he endured the promise. Uh, 
And then he says, for men swear by the greater and an oath of confirmation is end of all strife. He said the same thing in Galatians 3. You know, though it's a man's covenant, no man can add terms to it later to uh, disannul it. And what he was saying is that the law couldn't disannul this covenant. Um, but then he says, God willing more abundantly to show who? The heirs of the promise. Who are the heirs of the promise? And what promise are the heirs to? Well, they are heirs to the blessing that God promised to Abraham and his seed, which is Christ. Now, Galatians 3 makes the point that we have been baptized into Christ and have put him on. Um, wherefore, let's see. But after faith has come, we're no longer under the schoolmaster, for you're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, where there is neither Jew or Greek, bond or free, there is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Why are we Abraham's seed? Is it because we're Jew? No. Are we, is it because we're Gentile? No. It's because we've been baptized into Christ and have put him on. Who's Christ? Abraham's seed. To whom the promise was made? What promise? Well, it's unfolded through Scripture. Uh, in, in, in Genesis, it was just called the blessing. And it is the blessing of the Spirit. But it is also... See, he is not only just the seed of Abraham, but he's the seed of David. So it's the promises he included to him as the seed of David as well. What does that give him? It gives him the kingship a heavenly kingship that sits him at the right hand of God as the, as the son of God in resurrection, according to his humanity as the seed of David, gives him the rod of iron to rule the nations, and gives him the Melchizedek priesthood, which is not, again, according to the carnal ordinances, but according to the power of his incorruptible life and resurrection. What do we have as co-heirs? We are kings and priests. Where does that come from? It comes from the promises God made to the seed of David. It's, it's part of the Davidic covenant. So, uh, this is the, this, the promise to the seed of Abraham that was confirmed to the seed of Abraham, which is Christ, also includes the promises uh, to the seed of David. And the reason we know that is because chapter 6 of Hebrews tells us um, that it is according to the blessing of Abraham that Jesus was made a high priest. And it is by his high priesthood that we come into the holiest, which is our enjoyment of salvation and our position. Our position is not part of earthly Israel on the earth. We've been, we've been made partakers of the heavenly calling. calling. We've been raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenlies. We've been brought into the holiest where Christ himself has gone as our forerunner, and he is the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek to save us to the uttermost. All of that was given to him as the seed of David, but confirmed to him in Abraham's time. Do you see it? That God confirmed a covenant beforehand saying, in your seed uh, shall all the nations be blessed, and that seed is not one, uh, not many, but one, and that seed is Christ, and that we've been baptized into Christ and have put him on. And that furthermore, Christ is the seed of David. who He was born according to the flesh, uh, the seed of David, but declared to be the Son of God with power according to the resurrection from the dead. And in that declaration, he was given the place at God's right hand, right? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. He was given the rod of iron and the nations of his inherit as his inheritance. Ask me and I will uh, give you the nations as your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth as your possession, you will rule them with a rod of iron. And he was given the high priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek. Uh, the Lord has sworn and will not repent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. All that comes from Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. So Hebrews makes its appeals not to a future new covenant with Israel, but to this covenant that God confirmed with Abraham's seed, who is the seed of David, 
before the law, 430 years before the law, when the oven and the torch passed through the pieces, and that is the gospel. Um, the reason I know that's the gospel is because Galatians 3 tells us that the scripture preached the gospel to Abraham, uh, saying, in your seed, here it is, and the scripture foreseeing God would justify the nations through faith, preached before the uh, gospel to Abraham, saying, in you shall the Gentiles be blessed, and the nations be blessed. And that's when Abraham believed God and it was come to him for righteousness. So Abraham believed a gospel that was a, com a covenant between God and Abraham's seed made in his time. And later it was revealed more that this seed would be so much more than even Abraham could have thought. It was revealed to David that his seed, God would call him Lord and God would call him a son. And that he would sit at the right hand of God. And that he would inherit the nations and rule them forever with a rod of iron. And he would be a high priest. David knew that there would be a new priesthood. According to the order of Melchizedek and the power of his incorruptible life. Uh, and that is what our gospel is based on. And what the nations... Uh, are, what, 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 it's what our salvation is based on, I'm sorry. And that is also the gospel for every individual that's ever believed. Okay? The Christ, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. That's why Matthew, the first words uh, in the New Testament, is the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. What is that referring to? Well, God made a covenant to the Abrahamic seed, Christ. And that seed is also, it, it, that, that covenant is that all the nations will be blessed in him. But more specifically, he's the seed of David, which means he's the son of God, okay? And that he will reign over the nations. Not even, not more than that, he will sit at God's own right hand. And he'll have a priesthood, according to the order of Melchizedek. And between his kingship and his priesthood is our salvation. That's where salvation comes from. That's where the forgiveness of sins comes from. Now, it is that that gives him a position to then be the mediator of a new covenant with Israel. Okay, And that's all he's saying in chapter 8 is that the fact that there's a new covenant with Israel proves that the old one is passing away. But Jesus is the mediator of it. His blood purchased the redemption not only for the sins of that nation, but for everybody. He's the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. Uh, now, there is a specific covenant promised of the forgiveness of sins for Israel in the new covenant. I'll forgive their sins and iniquities I'll remember no more. So if we're not partakers of the new covenant, then where do we get ours? Well, Paul says in Colossians that we are in Christ and in him we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Why? Because Christ himself is the propitiation, and we are in him. See, he accomplished the work in himself, and then he distributes it as he wills it, it, according to what he promised he would do. But the forgiveness of sins is based on his blood. It's his blood before it's the blood of the new covenant. Yes, it's the blood of the new covenant for Israel, but it's also Christ's blood. And we ha there's a reference to the sure mercies of David. Because I was thinking about that. If we're not under the new covenant, then where do we get our forgiveness of sins from? Because it says, and their sins and iniquities I'll remember no more, right? Well, he promised it uh, in the inheritance to, Abraham, uh, to David's seed. And it's called the sheer mercies of David. Uh... And let me get that real quick. First of all, um, Peter quotes this. We're going to look at Isaiah 55. Um, but Peter quotes it in Acts. Uh, bear with me. I'm sorry. I'm looking at my computer and the phone at the same time. I'm, I'm wrapping up here. Um, verses. David. Dang it. David. 
Okay, Acts 13. When he talks about raising him from the dead, and as concerning that he raised him from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he says on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Okay, that is, a, that is something that God says to Christ based on his resurrection. That's Peter's interpretation by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now what he's quoting from is Isaiah. And we'll look at this chapter real quick. Uh, Ho, everyone that thirsts, come you to the waters, and you that buy and have no money, come you and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk, and without money, without price, why do you spend your money for that which is bread, not bread? Your labor for that which satisfies not, hearken diligently to me, and eat that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come to me, hear, your soul will live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Befo behold, I've given for him for a witness to the people and a leader and commander to the people. Um, behold, you will call not a nation you will not, you know not, sorry, and nations that you knew not shall run to thee because of the Lord your God and the, the Holy One of Israel for he's glorified thee. Who's he talking to? According to Peter, he's talking to Christ. So this is another reference to a decree that God made to the seed of David. We have Psalm 2, Psalm 110, and according to Peter, Isaiah 55. But we are included in it. Why? Because we are co-heirs with Christ, having been baptized into him. So not only is it Christ, but it's all who come to him and drink. Remember Jesus said, uh, Anyone who is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Out of, as the scripture says, he that believes on me out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. What is that based on? That's based on the covenant that the father made with the son that made him the shepherd of the sheep. Remember David is a shepherd? I, I don't think that's a coincidence. <laughs> Jesus is our shepherd. And he, uh, it is the everlasting covenant that makes him the great shepherd of the sheep. And according to John 10, it is according to that covenant, his role, or at least his commandment that he received from the Father, that he lay his life down for the sheep. And he give his life to the sheep. And that's why I said there is no provision in the new covenant in Hebrews 8 or in Jeremiah 31 or Ezekiel 26 for eternal life. Eternal life comes out of the sonship and the high priesthood of Christ. And it's for every individual who's justified by faith in him, regardless of what administration they live under. Now, we have received that life already, okay? But the Jews will be raised to a life, eternal life. Is it the same life? I, I think it probably is. Resurrection is Christ. Christ is the resurrection. But the new covenant, again, is for mortals, to live in the land. And yes, it's forever because it secures the land forever and every one of their seed who is born into the land will uh, be holy and God will put his spirit in them and cause them to walk in his ways. And yes, that's entirely of grace, okay? Not, not of law keeping. I mean, it, it, they keep it, but it is totally God working in them by grace. Now, Eternal life, though, is Christ himself. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. He's the only one who has the authority to give it. And he did, he did that by a commandment that he says he received from the Father in John 10. So Hebrews has, again, a reference to Psalm 2 for our co-heirship with Christ to, for the great salvation that subjects the world to come to us and even angels seats us, makes us partakers of the heavenly calling, and sits us in the heavens. And then at Psalm 110, for the priesthood, which is according to the order of Melchizedek, after the power of an incorruptible life, because Jesus, just like Melchizedek, was without father, without mother, having endless life, no record of his death, no record of living for, you know, Melchizedek was a type of Christ in that he was a picture of the Son of God. It's his sonship that the priesthood is based off of. Then Hebrews 6 makes the argument that this covenant was confirmed with Abraham's seed in Genesis 15. 
And that argument is parallel with Galatians 3, making the same argument. That the covenant which was confirmed before uh, of God in Christ, which was made with Abraham's seed, which is not of many, but of one, which is Christ. And that covenant was the gospel that was preached to Abraham. And he believed it and was justified. So again, we're not talking about the new covenant, which isn't mentioned till way later for the house of Israel. There was no house of Israel during Abraham's time. No, it was specifically uh, this gospel that gives us the blessing, which is the everlasting life, which comes out of his uh, kingship as the son of David, his sonship, and his priesthood. And it's called the mercies of David. And so he says in Isaiah 53, uh, I'll make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Who's he talking to? Abraham, uh, David's seed. How do we know that? Because Peter said it. Acts 13. Okay, but the sure mercies of David is where he gets his resurrection from. And that comes from the covenant God made with Christ in uh, 2 Samuel. Um, hold on just a second. Dang it. Okay, 2 Samuel. I'm trying to hold a lot in my mind at once. You can tell it's, it's a little difficult. Uh, only people who like me are going to follow this message. <laughs> but remember, God promised David concerning his seed. This is what we call the Davidic covenant. When your days will be fulfilled and you shall sleep with your fathers, I will set your seed up after thee which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's what we call the throne of his glory. That is a literal kingship, the throne that the seed of David will possess. Gabriel confirmed that promise to Mary and said he will sit upon the throne of his house, father David and rule over the house of Jacob forever. And he says, here's the sonship. I will be his father, and he will be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy, here's the mercies of David, will not depart from him. Okay? The, as I took it from Saul, who I put away before thee. Why is Christ's throne going to last forever? Because of the mercies of David. Saul was not under those mercies. Christ, even if he sinned, which he didn't, okay? He loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Uh, the mercies wouldn't depart from him, right? Because if he will commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul. In other words, even if he sins, yeah, there will be discipline, but he's a son, and he'll live forever, and his throne will endure forever. That's where his resurrection comes from. Now, Jesus was beaten with the stripes of men and with the rod of men, right? For who? For us, who are also included in this promise because we are in him. We've been baptized into him and made partakers, co-heirs, joint heirs with everything he has, his kingship and his priesthood, and yet we're sinners. And he took our sins upon him and bore them. By his stripes, we are healed. Now, according to Peter, that is related to his role as the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. That title shepherd is really interesting how it keeps showing up. The shepherding of Christ to lead us into eternal life is based on the everlasting covenant. That is not between God and any man, but is between God and Christ. And it's based on that covenant, which has a commandment in it, that he would lay his life down for the sheep, that we have eternal life. The forgiveness of our sins, which were all laid on him, our iniquities, he bore them. That's not according to the Hebrews uh, quote of Jeremiah 31, their sins I won't remember anymore. It's greater than that. It's based on the oath that God swore and the covenant he made with himself 430 and confirmed 430 years before the law. Before there was even a law to define sin. God confirmed this covenant in Christ, which includes our forgiveness of sins. 
our forgiveness of sins, again, does not come from the law of Israel or the law of Moses. It comes because we're in Christ. In him we have redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. We've been baptized into the one who is the seed. He's the seed of Abraham and he's the seed of David. And that is our gospel. The Galatians 3 says that the gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham, saying in, all your, in your seed the nations will be blessed. And Paul says that the gospel of God is concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. In the book of Acts, Peter never makes any references to the new covenant. He always makes reference to the resurrection of Christ and the Psalms, which give him these de declarations. Uh, and you can just look that up. Go read Peter's speeches. You'll see that he keeps referring to David. Why was Christ raised from the dead and why do we have forgiveness of sins? It's because of the mercies of David. So uh, this came out of a conversation because I was having a conversation in WhatsApp with somebody who was she saying, I want to talk about the forgiveness of sins without mentioning Hebrews 8 because it's such a hot topic right now. But we all know, you know, his, our sins he'll never remember again. Are we getting that from the new covenant? And I'd been thinking about this for a few days anyway, that no. The, ultimately, the forgiveness of sins for us is because he was, chast he, he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. As the seed of David. <laughs> uh, and God swore that his mercies would not depart from him and we've been baptized into him. And yeah, he blotted out our sins. They're, they're, we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins in him. And as the one who's accomplished all this, he's also in a position to be the mediator of the new covenant for Israel. But again, the only reference to that in Hebrews is just to tell us that the fact that they're making a new covenant with Israel proves that the Mosaic law is, is waxing old and passing away. Every other appeal in Hebrews, and there's at least these four, makes reference to the covenant that God confirmed with Christ beforehand in Abraham's day that also is related to his sonship as the seed of David and his Melchizedek priesthood as the seed of David in resurrection. And those are all different components of the everlasting covenant, which has in it the mercies of David and the shepherding of the sheep. Remember, David's the shepherd. Well, so is his seed, the real shepherd, the good shepherd. So to me, this was delightful and edifying. Uh, someone else might just look at it as minutiae, but I really enjoyed it. I think there's a few of you out there that will. Take care.